A lot of people find it difficult to express their emotions because they're afraid and um, certain emotions can feel really like overwhelming and um, like almost like too powerful whereas if you've got a piece of paper that actual paper is a literal container and so it it helps you to contain what it is that you want to express and it gives you a bit of separation so you're able to stand back and actually look at what you're creating mm. um, and through the process of creation I mean on the one hand you know there is this um, I guess this process of creation which is you know your your soul wanting to express itself Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have Zyra Mogol. Zyra is an integrative art psychotherapist, creative well-being facilitator, and energy healer. She has spent the last six years coaching, designing, and facilitating creative spaces that ignite self-awareness and well-being interpersonal learning and collective leadership to create more equitable world. She is known for her playful, embodied and intuitive approach to creative well-being and has successfully supported hundreds of people that was feeling stuck in life to listen to the wisdom of their life force, intuition, body, heart and mind intelligence and transform their ways of being, feeling, thinking, doing, and being with others. Let's bring her on. Hi, Zaira. How are you doing? Hi, Madiha. I'm doing really well. Happy it is Friday. Oh, yes. Yeah, Friday. <laughs> yeah. We can come in and we can all rest and chill and do whatever we want to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have you had a busy week? Yeah, it's been uh, pretty non-stop, actually, so... Yeah, it's, to... it's eclipse, energy, eclipse energy, isn't it? It's the same with me. It's like, tuk, 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 tuk. Yeah. <laughs> we just go, we're working at it. Um, So, you know, I'm just thinking back, when did we first met? We've actually never met in person. We've, <laughs> yeah, we, we just kind of crossed paths on Facebook, just in comments somewhere, and then ended yeah. up adding you. And then I joined TikTok. For the first time, was like, okay, well, what is this TikTok all about? And I saw you immediately popped up. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to friend this person because I know this person. And then you were talking about art uh, psychotherapy and, you know, we talking about arts. And I was like, well, that's quite interesting. I want to get this person on my podcast. Um, and then since then, like, here we are. Like, we, wow. yeah, we're going to be talking about your life and your, you know, your, what you do. But yeah. before then, um, Tell us about yourself, you know, a brief overview of who you are, who's Zyra. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like that is such a big question, who is Zyra? But um, I guess I'm going to break it down by starting with who I am and what I'm doing right now. So um, I am a integrative art psychotherapist and I'm a creative well-being facilitator and I'm an energy healer and I'm a human being amidst all of that too. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, with all the emotions and everything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But um, actually I'm in, I'm in my third career at the moment. Um, so the art psychotherapeutic world um, is my third career. I actually um, moved to Dubai. So I left the UK in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And um, I moved to Dubai and I lived there for about uh, just over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I, I started my career um, in events and communications. And I got married and essentially that part of my life was me doing what I thought I needed to do to be successful. In the eyes of my family and, um, you know, in the eyes of society. Um, and it was really like at the end of those 10 years that I had my um, awakening. And I know that we're going to go yeah. deeper into that. But part of that was around me questioning, who am I? Why am I here? Um, and I was able to um, 
gift myself actually that's the way that I like to see it mm-hmm. I was able to take a year off of life you know um, I stopped um, working and I packed up my belongings put everything in storage and um, I went to Latin America um, so South and Central America and I traveled for a year by myself um, and I backpacked and it was really a chance for me to get to know myself um who I am you know what is it that excites me inspires me what is it that I want from this gift of life yeah Um, amazing yeah and that sort of led me into a second career which was in community development um working in the non-profit space and then it was around the time of the pandemic Mm -hmm. that I um actually decided that I want to train to become uh, an art psychotherapist. So in Mm -hmm. 2020 and and since then, I'm in, yeah, this whole world of what it means to be human. Yeah, amazing. You've been on quite a journey. So let's take you back um, to your childhood, right? Um, What was your childhood like? What was the background, your parents? What What was the environment like? Yeah, I mean... I am um, mixed ethnicity, so um, Indian, Pakistani, Persian. Um, I'm the youngest uh, daughter of three, so I've got two older sisters. And um, both of my parents were actually born in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, my dad's side of the family, they were living in Uganda, And in the 70s, there was a sort of military coup in Uganda, where the um, then person in power, Indi Ami, he essentially kicked out all of the South Asians from Uganda. And so my dad and his side of the family actually arrived um, in the UK as refugees. um, And they lived in a refugee camp in Lincolnshire for about a year. um, And they were assigned to live in Derby, um, Mm. which is actually where my family are currently living. And that's where, that's where I was born. Mm. Um, So yeah, I mean, I guess my family are um, are Muslim. Mm. So I was, um, I was raised um, as a Muslim. I actually let go of religion. Um, about eight years ago so this was part of my awakening yeah where I got to <laughs> figure out you know who I am um so I, I I'm you know I no longer practice that particular faith but you know on the one hand yeah I guess my upbringing was um in some ways conservative you know my my parents were also quite or they like to think of themselves as being quite like liberal and progressive um but there were a lot of restrictions a lot of limitations that were that was placed on 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 me and my sisters and you know my cousins and and those in my immediate family um when we were when we were children when we were growing up you know um like i said as long as, as much as my my family are um sort of liberal there is this view that they have i think it's deeply ingrained within the you know a South Asian culture around the role of a woman Mm. and what it means to be a woman and you know um, as much as my family sort of um, encouraged us when it came to you know education um, and they celebrated our success when it came to our careers it wasn't necessarily valued Mm. And I think there's a difference between the two. I think success really um, through the eyes of my my parents and the larger family system was around um, getting married. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. Arrange <laughs> marriages as well. As soon yeah. as you hit like even 15, it's like, there's this person, there's that person, there's this person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's definitely a part of my culture. I mean, my parents had an arranged marriage and as much as um you know me and one of one of my sisters um we didn't that was still within the field of our family you know we turned a certain age and you know 18 and uh before anyone thinks about university and what's next for you know who you are and what you're good at and what you want to do in life it's about right 
let's find her a husband. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So were you quite rebellious to it whenever you would get like these, what do you call it, invitations <laughs> marriage? Yeah. So, yeah. What well, would you, what was your, yeah, what was your reaction to it every time that they would come up to you and just say like, oh, this person? Yeah, it was an absolute no. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, my parents weren't um they weren't like forceful um yeah. and I think because you know because I was the youngest of of three um I was also very different from my other two sisters mm. and I think my parents recognized that mm. um, the other two weren't very sort of um studious academically and so they didn't necessarily um, push them or force them to carve out a career um, in any particular domain it was more like you know what is it that you're good at what's going to make you happy um, whereas as a child I always had this like fire mm. within me you know there was always this sense of like I'm going to do and I will and I'll achieve mm. and so I actually ended up being um, the first one in my family to go to university wow. um, and so I left home when I was 18 and um, I went to Manchester and I was there for three years. Mm -hmm. um, I studied film and media. And then as soon as I graduated, um, I was 21 and I decided to move to Dubai. Mm -hmm. And so at that point in my life, you know, putting myself in the shoes of my 21 year old self, I was very conscious of, you know, um, I don't want to continue living in Manchester. I don't want to move back to Derby because there's no career opportunities. Um, I don't want to move to London. And yet I had traveled to Dubai a few times mm. because my dad, um, he used to be as a, as a hobby. He was a rally driver. Oh, um, right. Yeah. And so we'd spend quite a few holidays out there. And mm. I guess I saw the like opportunities of the fact that Dubai in the UAE, it's a developing country and, you know, there's 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 lots going on there. So that's what my 21 year old self said. Mm. Years later, if I'm honest with myself, um, I felt like I was running away mm. from the watchful eye of not just my family, but then my extended family and also people in the community you know in in Derby it's a very um small sort of tight-knit um Pakistani community Muslim community Indian community and I think because my family in particular came from Kenya um we were always like the different ones oh yeah and um <laughs> yeah I guess a, a theme that you know was running throughout my life when I was uh, growing up was just this feeling of um of not belonging mm. Mm. and part of me you know going to the UAE is I think on a soul level I felt like I belonged here and that's also because I looked like the people of the country mm. you know? and, and people come up to me and they would speak Arabic because they thought that I was from the UAE or they would speak uh, Farsi to me thinking that I was you know Iranian and yeah, yeah it was this deep self of sense of like this is the place where I can be myself mm -hmm. yeah. and it's 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 really um I, I mean I get that as well like you know you have even if you look the same, you're still different because either your belief is different or you're different type of Muslim or you're non-Muslim or you're, or you're this, this, this. And there's a lot of judgment in yeah. the culture itself, you know? And also people do talk like if you, if you're not married by a certain time frame, yeah, then, oh, what's wrong with her? And exactly. a lot of shit. And then that was, again, talking about shame brings yeah. shame on the family brings shame on the person no big shame on the com in the community because it's so tight-knit absolutely mm. and that's where this watchful eye came in you know I never thought that I had permission to be myself because everything that I did was a reflection of my family and the reputation just mm. like you said mm. um and yeah it was um it was a struggle because 
there were just so many rules and there's so many shoulds and so many expectations Mm. you know of of who I who I should be Mm. so do you think like you know so you've spent like you know a chunk of your life just running away and then coming into how did you feel when you came into that realization that I was like oh actually I'm running away from my from all of this I mean it it made sense Mm. you know It, it made sense that I had um I had run away Mm. and 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 why I had run away you know Mm. um because I recognized that you know I named this fire um there's always been this I guess like a free spirit you know as a as a as a child I've always been a free spirit Mm. um I've always been um you know independent Mm. and um you know self-reliant you know Mm. and I I also recognize why I am the way I am looking back to on my childhood Mm. because on the one hand um you know I did have a um loving safe and secure family and at the same time the role that I played within my family was very much the um the people pleaser so I yeah (laughs) very common yes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's also you know part of the culture as well um especially considering the culture and what it means to be a woman through the lens of that culture mm. it's all about service to the other yes. so I was deeply conditioned mm. to put everyone else's needs ahead of mine mm. um mm. you know when considering you know my my mother she's been through a lot in her life um I'm not going to go into the the depths of her trauma and yet what that meant for me is that from a very young age I ended up mothering my mother I <laughs> oh ended my god up, yeah, yeah. So I'm in the helping profession oh my god well you're a healer that's why <laughs> yeah the wounded healer right? the wounded healer yes you gotta go through your own things yeah. <laughs> your own journey <laughs> Uh, before you can support others but yeah I mothered my mum I also mothered my sisters Mm. and so you know there was a point where for example when my parents went through um, their separation and divorce which was also another huge taboo within Mm. um, the 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 culture that I, I come from um but when they had sort of when they were navigating their their separation you know, they told me first, they didn't tell my elder two sisters. Mm. And so I was the one who um, had to tell my sisters and support them to um, essentially manage their emotions and process what was happening. Mm. Um, and, you know, comfort them and console them. Yeah. Um, and you're, and that, you're, sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say, and that's the kind of... Um, comfort emotional consolidation that I never got from Mm. my parents because Mm. another layer of our culture is around not expressing your feelings oh yes that's a big one that is a big one everything under the carpet you're not allowed to express you're not allowed to feel um but you just have to play this role that everything is okay and this is why so many just walk around with a mask absolutely yeah and we silence ourselves you know Mm. and um again unintentionally there was this sort of um conditioning around as a woman my opinions don't matter and it's the men in the family that you know know right from wrong and it's their version of right and wrong and so the whole you know being told to shut up or essentially it boils down to don't think you know, mm. that's one of the kind of beliefs that mm. were um, conditioned within me that my opinions mm. and my intellect isn't valued. Mm. And um, it's just, it does feel like in the cultures of like very masculine based and masculine is all about suppression and just doing and they don't not looking at stuff. So that energy is within the feminine as well. Um, and you know, I, there's only so much that you could do because that kind of just leaves the trauma itself. I mean, we all yeah. know that trauma just literally like you, you just somebody at a Tesco spoke really rudely towards you. And that's yeah. a rotten tomato right in there. 
and we don't we don't know how to deal with it you know so yeah. there's like generation like you said your mom had had has trauma mm -hmm. but uh, that would cover, probably coming out in her physical symptoms as well you know like a lot of a lot of I've seen uh, what well, certainly in my family yeah. before uh, at a young age they're starting to get like um physical illnesses you know my mom for example um I've been caring for her like again I mean I can totally resonate with you in terms of looking after mothering your mother you yeah. know and and at the age of 14 when she became ill after my dad passed away I was just doing all of that and then it, she was only I don't know how old like 50 40 in her 40s maybe that yeah. she started to get like severe rheumatoid arthritis and even since my childhood you know yeah. so she was always goes in the category of people pleaser and um, terrified and anxious you know and yeah so I can just totally relate as well because there's so many women in our culture I can, can see like, it's like the the trauma is really showing up in their physical body at the moment yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, all of that expression gets suppressed. And at one point, you know, like the pressure cooker, mm. it's going to yeah. explode. It's, it's, yeah. it's going to come out yeah. in the worst possible way. Uh, it, the, uh, the, I think the, heart, the, the heartbreaking thing is that when it explodes in that environment, mm -hmm. you suppress it even more. Yeah. That's the worst thing where... You can see someone having a mental breakdown rather than understanding that, okay, even therapy, therapy itself in yeah. some of the culture, it's not okay. There's something wrong with you. Yeah. You know, there's a flow in you. Yeah. Nobody, it will bring shame to the family. It will bring shame to the community. What if people find out that you, you went to therapy? They'll think you have mental health issues. Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. so much stigma in society about you know mental health and you know when I think back to the point that I experienced my you know dark night of the soul where I really broke down mm. that was around 10 years ago mm. and um, mental health wasn't something that was really spoken about mm. um, you know out in the sort of public domain compared to the ways in which we recognize mental health and mental ill health today you know that wasn't for sure the environment that I was in 10 years ago when I needed um support mm. you know and, and wasn't able to access it mm. and then on top of that I think within again like the South Asian um community there's a huge stigma around mental health um not just around what's wrong with you but more so around um this image that we're trying to show the rest of the world. And so you're literally not allowed yeah. to talk about, or at least that was my experience. Yeah. You're not allowed to talk about anything bad, yeah. you know? Um, it's all like behind sort of closed doors, you know? Yeah, exactly. And then it's often as well goes back into the arranged marriages kind of thing where someone could be having a deep, trauma like for as that example uh, a guy they come to you and say like, oh he's he's a doctor he's this is this that and then you're you're you get married like on the surface because everything is okay you get married and then you find out that this is like okay that might turn out to be a narcissist or might turn out to be really like a traumatic marriage itself so um but then you're not you feel such shame in leaving that as well so you get stuck yeah. in that um toxic relationship for rest of your life or even years and years you know because yeah. then you're 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 shunned from the community you're shunned from your family um yeah, yeah. and you're also at least my experiences um you know within my family and culture has been that there's almost a sense of this is the way it is mm. being in these toxic loveless marriages is normal mm. that's what everyone around me is in mm. and so shut up and suck it up yeah so it's like the nip it in the bud was no 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 <laughs> yeah and even the the choice to leave you know it's not even yeah. an, an option because yeah. of the the shame that you would bring to you know the the, the whole family mm. Mm. yeah um 
so we obviously like we we talked a bit about your uh awakening um so how did that come about you know what was your what was your story of awakening yeah I mean um essentially I you know was like I said I was I was living in Dubai and um I had a very successful um career in uh, events and communications and um you know, I was married and I was trying to be perfect. Mm. I was trying to be the perfect wife. I was trying to be the perfect friend, um, colleague. At that point, I had my own business. So I was trying to do everything mm. that um, I thought I should be doing um, mm. in order to, yeah, be be valued, be celebrated in society and ultimately what led to um my awakening was um my separation and divorce um Mm. with my now ex-husband and so at that point in my life I also had put the mask on Mm. so outwardly everyone would look at us as this um charming energetic couple you know really successful marriage um but on the inside and I would definitely play that role of like keeping up Mm. appearances and sort of faking it um but on the inside you know we were deeply um in distress as a couple Mm. and yet we both weren't didn't have a a level of self-awareness um in terms of actually understanding what's going on for ourselves individually Mm. and how that's playing out um you know within the dynamics of our relationship and so I went through this really um dark period um with my ex-husband where um I was absolutely insecure Mm. um all of my self-worth um was wrapped up in his opinion of who you know I who I am Mm. and there was um a lot of betrayal Mm. you know which meant that I was really in the place of um insecurity unworthiness um absolutely zero self-love comparing myself to everyone around me and ultimately he wanted to leave me he asked for a divorce Mm. and I was at that point so tired of trying to be everything for everyone Mm. that I couldn't I couldn't see I couldn't see a way out of this feeling I couldn't see um a future Mm. you know without him and so and I was I was basically exhausted and the only option that I could see for myself was to end my life. Mm. Um, And that was, yeah, that was definitely the the sort of darkest moment. And um, I didn't have support because in my family, I'm the strong one, Mm. you know, that's the role that I play with my friends too. So I'm the one that people come to when they're struggling and they need support and guidance and strength and you know all of that and yet there was a part of me that wasn't able to be vulnerable and actually ask for help too Mm. so I got to that point where I had um it wasn't even an explosion thinking back to that sort of gas cooker it was more of an implosion Mm. you know I felt so I felt I, I fell so deep into myself Um, It was almost like I was what we would call a functioning depressive, you know, inside I'm broken, feeling broken. um, And yet to the outside world, I'm able to carry on with uh, with day to day life. Um, But really, when I had sort of come out of the other the other end of that, the other side of that, that's when I questioned, you know, um, why am I here? Hmm. And it was such a strong pull and a strong like knowing in my soul that I am here on this earth for more. Mm. And at that point in my life, you know, when I think about my career, um, I knew that I wasn't, 
I wasn't feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And yet, what is my purpose? You know, how do I know what fulfillment is? I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And that's what then sparked, um, you know, my decision to let go of this business. Uh, I had an events agency. I can't put my, you know, I can't put everything into it and, and make it succeed because my heart's not in it. And so my definition of success was a blank. Mm. Um, and yeah, like I said, I was gifted with the opportunity to actually take a year out. And, um, you know, the, the sort of initial purpose of me traveling was to volunteer mm. um, because I had this need of being of service and wanting to give back. Mm. Um, and so I ended up um, uh, working in, in Argentina where I had um, built uh, an after school care center for underserved children. Mm -hmm. So even that was just so liberating in terms of, you know, instead of like being stuck behind a desk and on my laptop and coming up with creative concepts and stuff, I was using my hands, I was doing physical work. Mm. Um, and then I, I worked um, at a shelter for uh, women and children who were survivors of um, domestic and sexual violence and abuse. Mm -hmm. um and that's where I essentially worked as like an arts teacher <laughs> oh amazing yeah mm -hmm. um and that's the first time that I had sort of tapped into um the power of the arts mm -hmm. um, because I was with children um from you know age five to 15 where some of the children were so sort of closed down shut down Hmm. And yet the moment that I put a piece of paper in front of them and gave them some materials, they would just come to life. Um, I guess that's like um, kind of leads me to the next question, really, is that what is art psychotherapy? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah, so um, art psychotherapy is um, essentially... It's a form of psychotherapy which uses lots of different creative modalities mm -hmm. as a way for people to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, express themselves beyond words. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the traditional uh, psychotherapies are um, called talking therapies, whereas the way in which I work, um, I, I use, for example, 2D image making. So this can include all different types of material like paint chalk mm. pastels um i work with 3d image making so um using clay um, or plasticine to create sculptures craft materials um i work with uh puppets mm. with um sand tray and objects um with music uh poetry um the way that I work is trauma informed. So a lot of mm -hmm. body based mm -hmm. movements, drama. So there's this whole range mm -hmm. of creative modalities that is so um, powerful in terms of actually supporting someone to describe the depth of their experience. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes um, a lot of people don't have the language um for how they're feeling mm. um you know someone can say that you know I feel I feel a bit sad and a bit alone and yet if they paint an image of um themselves in a cold dark ICC where they're barely keeping like their head above water it just paints a whole different perspective of how this person um is experiencing life Wow. Yeah. So um, you talk about, yeah, obviously there's a trauma as well. Like we, 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 have, we were having a conversation about this, the trauma that's like stuck in the body. And you find that in the kids, you know, where um, when, when that's when you got first glimpse of how much that the art brings them to life. So how does it work with the trauma? You know, like we keep, body keeps the score. So yeah. how does the art brings it, really brings it out, you know, like one when, when you're really doing the work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, essentially, you know, the, the arts are connected to the right 
right part of our brain, the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And that's the part of our brain that governs our sensations, our emotions, and um, our unconscious beliefs. Mm -hmm. So these are the beliefs that are stored in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And the left side of the brain, just as a comparison, is what governs more of our rational thoughts and rational thinking. And so that's the place of the brain, the left, that most people tend to get stuck, Mm. um, where they repeat the same kind of thoughts that influence them to take the same, you know, behaviors, actions. And it's a very, it can be quite a a fixed way of of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas, you know, when you activate the right hand side of your brain through the arts, um, you know, it it paints a whole other, well, it gives you access to a whole other perspective. So on the one hand, when I'm just thinking about like feelings and emotions, a lot of people find it difficult to express their emotions because they're afraid. And um, certain emotions can feel really like overwhelming and um, like almost like too powerful, whereas, if you've got a piece of paper, that actual paper is a literal container. And mm-hmm. so it it helps you to contain what it is that you want to express. And it gives you a bit of separation. Mm-hmm. You know? So you're able to stand back and actually look at what you're creating. Mm-hmm. Um, and through the process of creation, I mean, on the one hand, you know, there is this, um, I guess, this process of creation, which is, you know, your your soul wanting to express itself. Mm. Um, and then on the other side of how we work with the arts, there's a reflective process too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because again, the arts are connected to the right side of our brain and our unconscious belief, there's a way of working with the arts where you're able to um, embody it. Mm-hmm. So when you create an image, you don't just talk about the image, but you talk from the perspective of the image. Mm. you're listening to the image you're in a dialogue with the image and a lot of those unconscious beliefs that are in your body or in the art start to come to the surface oh so that would be absolutely the ultimate trauma work and I'm just thinking for um kids because I work in um uh, primary schools and like you know we go in schools interview refugee uh, kids as well from all different backgrounds and you know one thing that they absolutely love is art like they're just drawing or they they want to play they want to have fun and express in that way but yeah. what i find is like at a certain age you lose that ability because you have to get out into the world right kids know that this is the creative sense of how i can release a trauma i'm going to go through this life right and at young age you know how to express it how to like just just be in the energy of it but as an adult you like you said left brain (laughs) completely left brain so when a trauma a rotten tomato I call all the traumas they hit you they hit you they're restored in the body we just can't simply express it you know we know we can purge it out by by feeling it sitting with it but arts is I guess it's like really really um creatively you can um not attach to it whatsoever but you're also releasing it at the same time yeah absolutely I mean um the the essence of 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 healing is around being able to feel your feelings Mm. and once you can safely feel your feelings that and process it in terms of where is this feeling coming from Mm -hmm. what is that that wound you know what is that belief that I have that's been holding me back Mm -hmm. once you can have some insight around that you've then got the power to feel a new feeling Mm -hmm. you know and think of a new sort of perspective and a new way like experiment Mm -hmm. with a new way of being and and living in the world Mm -hmm. that is more supportive towards your true essence you know the 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 soul inside of you which essentially I understand you know soul as your essential nature you know the part of you that is the most authentic you know the real you as opposed to the version of you that you've been conditioned to be 
Mm. And that's what happens from childhood onwards. You know, ultimately, as children, you know, up until like pretty much the age of um, seven. Seven, yeah. Based on, you know, what it is that we experience in our childhood in those formative early years, um, the interactions that we have with our families and people that are in our closest network who we mm. learn from, unconsciously, um, we're essentially coming up with a life plan. Mm. So unconsciously, we are formulating who we have to be and what we have to do in order to get our needs met. Mm. And these aren't just needs from a basic, you know, food, shelter, safety perspective, but also mm. um, what do we need to do to receive love? Mm. You know, that's the fundamental, like, core human yeah. need. Yeah. And um, because of that, we end up developing different parts of our personality, you know, where we decide that, we have to be strong and we're not allowed to show feelings, mm. you know, um, or we have to be perfect and we're not allowed to make mistakes or whatever those defense mechanisms are. Mm. But that all happens unconsciously without knowing. Mm. And so the way that I work um, and within psychotherapy, it's all about understanding, you know, what happened to you how did you experience life and therefore mm. helping you to understand you know why you you know developed in like you know why you developed in a certain way and and who you you know chose mm. to to be mm. so do you often find that um working with the adults um do you ever find that they're experiencing because I'm, I'm I'm thinking about internal family system when we go into the therapy of internal family system obviously it's parts work but the exile sometimes is stuck when they're at age of seven or there's trauma happened at the age of 13 or 14 or whatever age and it's stuck there and it's like playing the same loop so do you have often find that adults um kind of just draw memories of that experience that's happened where the part is stuck you know, in at that younger age? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, the core of a lot of my work is going back into someone's um, childhood, mm. you know, and it's what did I believe at the age of seven mm. um, that made me feel afraid, mm. you know, and um, all of this, like all of those unconscious beliefs, they, they manifest as we develop into adults. Mm. And so what often happens is, you can be in a, a situation, um, you know, in a relationship. It doesn't always have to be a romantic relationship. You could be in a relationship with your um, boss at work mm. where you react to your boss um, in a different way that you than you would with your, your friends and your family. Mm. And unconsciously, your boss reminds you of someone um, at a younger time in life. So it mm. could be, for example, your father. Mm. Mm. And Often time it is the parents' time. <laughs> Often time, yeah, the primal wounds. <laughs> but this is what plays out, you know. You could be in a situation where, um, you know, the relationship with your father was fear-based mm. and um, you weren't allowed to say no to him you know, and you had to please him. And so as a child, you were constantly walking on eggshells around your father and what are his moods and what what should you do or not do so that you don't trigger him and you don't upset him and you receive the brunt of his rejection or whatever it may be. Mm. And then you find yourself as an adult in a situation where um, your boss has similar qualities of your father. Mm. and consciously you're not aware of 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 this similarity mm. but you react to this person mm. in your present adult day and age as if you were that frightened child mm -hmm. yeah you know and it's through for example when we're in psychotherapy and someone can come in and can talk about that situation at work and um we go into their bodies you know wh where is this sensation of fear you know mm. oh it's in my stomach okay mm. let's deepen that let's breathe into that what are you hearing and it's the internalized voice of mm. their father with mm. the judgment and the criticism that they hear 
you know yeah. it's yeah. a memory that is related to a, a, an age where they were four or five that has like stayed as a form of trauma in their body Mm -hmm. you know once they tap into that they're able to make that connection oh wow it's this child fear and Mm -hmm. that I'm actually projecting onto my boss Mm -hmm. and so I'm reacting to him through the lens of that child Mm -hmm. and that process of just having that insight and being able to understand you know what is that belief okay I've got a really loud inner critic well, where is my inner nurturing voice, mm. you know? And we start mm. to build that strength. Mm. You know? So instead of reacting from a place of fear, you can catch yourself, right? If you're mm. in that situation again, mm. okay, I recognize I'm reacting this way towards my boss. I'm going to ground myself and talk myself up mm. before I go into my next meeting with my boss and I'm going to say no, mm. and I'm going to ask for what I want, and yeah. boundaries, and <laughs> boundaries. all this stuff. You know? What is that? Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I completely like it. I think it's just such an eye-opening, because I didn't know much about it, because from young uh when I was younger probably was like you know you know like how kids are and drawing and you know doing a very creative sense but then it stops because when you even when you hit trauma when you're younger or even if like life takes over and you just get into business or you get into this and this this you completely stop so you know we and even often in form of dancing yeah. Uh, a lot of adults feel a bit oh god like a bit rigid I'm, I want to have a drink and then I'll dance you know expressive yeah it's but it's 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 difficult um and yet it's not impossible and I, I think you you hit on it earlier where you were talking about um working with children and the sort mm-hmm. of playfulness around expression yeah I work with adults mm-hmm. and um you know part of the work is sort of supporting people to let go of that idea of perfection Mm. you know it doesn't matter what your art and what your image looks like you know it's about how it makes you feel and that act of the act of expression as opposed to suppression Mm. um I often like draw like sorry were you gonna say something oh no 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 I often draw like a stick man right so that's my way of but then there is a judgment against me there that I feel that I'm not a good enough I I can't draw I can't draw so there's a judgment in terms of I'm not good enough to do to even draw something so it's like as soon as my self-talk comes in and it's like you're not good enough then I'll be drawing just stick men like the smallest it's like so nobody can see and nobody I just want to hide you know and it's like I think it's that judgment as well where breaking free of that judgment no matter how you it just comes out anyway no matter how you are gonna draw how how you want to do things in life it's always perfect it's just that your belief it's just your belief yeah absolutely and you know I believe that everyone is creative everyone Mm. has the ability to express themselves Mm. and again that process of making art it's such a life affirming process Mm. because ultimately that expression comes from something inside of you Mm. so it could be a sensation in your body it's a feeling it's an insight and intuition but ultimately you're trusting yourself Mm -hmm. tapping into what's happening inside of me in my inner world Mm. and I trust myself to express it Mm. You know, and when we think about um, healing or let's say even the, the the opposite of expression, right, the suppression and so on that we've um, spoken about, mm. um, that's essentially, you know, where, in my opinion, illness comes from. Mm. You know? When we stop ourselves, when we limit ourselves, when we silence ourselves, our, 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 it's almost like our soul um, is at a state of um, dis-ease yeah the, the yeah. survival as well the state of exactly. survival yeah um, I was gonna just, just quickly mention about um, the art is expression and creativity but um, it's more of a feminine energy isn't it 
it's a very feminine energy and also because uh, the it feels like a feminine because then if you're suppressing and then you you through art I guess it comes out really strongly you know um then I was yeah, yeah. I don't know what your stance on it because I'm just thinking about it it's like yeah. is, that, is that really feminine this flow um I would say it's actually a balance of mm -hmm. the masculine and the feminine right so how how is the masculine um how is it balanced with the masculine energy then so for me the masculine energy is around um the physical act mm. of expression that kind of assertion you know the 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 taking action mm -hmm. i've had this thought i've had this feeling i'm in my flow i'm i'm in touch with myself right now i'm expressing it into the world right okay that's the kind of um i see it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Symbiosis yeah. that i i see between between the two yeah so you um, can just align if if so if somebody is really out in touch with that creativity and expression um and would want to bring more of a balance and um like the with that feminine side then arts will be absolutely perfect even even if they're too feminine they can bring in the masculine you know it would be absolutely perfect yeah and um vice versa too you know mm -hmm. if you're really in your masculine you know if you're really in your sort of left brain thinking yeah and you're not really in your feelings and emotions then you know, art psychotherapy or the arts can be really powerful. I mean, ultimately, you know, my belief is that um, health comes from a place of balance. Mm. So if you're too in your feminine, then you may be, um, you know, in your in your feeling state, but yeah. you don't have that self trust and autonomy to actually take action in the world. Yes. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Whereas if Perfect. you're too much in your cognitive thinking mm -hmm. and this like sense of like strength and you know I'm not allowed to be weak and and, and vulnerable then you're also hiding parts of yourself yeah, yeah um and so psychotherapy in the arts is really around um exploring all of the different polarities mm. that we we have in life the the things that we tell ourselves you know mm. I'm allowed to be this but I'm not allowed to be that and how mm. can you be both yeah, yeah. And as a form of, of integration. Yeah. So how many, like, do you have, like, set sessions that you do with your clients or um, for them to say if they're coming and they have quite a strong, deep trauma, um, how long does it take for them to just get into the, like, um, bring their mask down, really? You know, how long does it take? Yeah, I mean... Um there isn't a, a, a set golden rule because every single person is unique. Mm. You know? And um, some people um, are trusting um, and are quite open, mm. um, you know, at the beginning and, and some, and some aren't. So there, there isn't like a golden rule. And I guess, um, you know, when I practice in my, in my private practice, um, there isn't like a limit mm. in terms of the, number of sessions that I would um you know the, the length of time that I would work with someone um and it's something that we would decide together mm -hmm. um, and so I've got longer term clients who I've been working with for over a year mm. versus when I work with for example within the NHS um it's a limited number of sessions yeah yeah and so yeah. um some organizations allow 12 sessions only mm. And so we're very focused in terms of what area of life are you feeling most stuck in? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll create like a therapeutic goal mm -hmm. um, around, you know, how can we help you to kind of get out of this feeling of of, of stuckness? Mm -hmm. um, it depends. Yeah. It's basically, yeah. yeah. It's a lifelong, really. <laughs> it's, a, it's lifelong because like when you're doing a lot of like internal work and not just like, it, it takes... It takes a while, but it gets easier, I guess, like, you know, and then you just kind of hone in those tools for whatever you're doing in life. Yeah. And it's a process of unraveling, too. You know, ultimately, when I when I work with people, it's really to support them to understand themselves, mm. so, you know, getting into the place of 
understanding not just what do I believe Mm. but why do I believe what I believe Mm. you know Mm. it's those are really unpacking those layers of uh, conditioning Mm. and it's almost like once you start questioning Mm. you know you can never not know anymore and so that questioning then extends to every aspect (laughs) of life I guess some people would just have a have a spiritual awakening right there and then it's like you know, I'm questioning my belief is coming out in the arts. <laughs> What's exactly. happening? Like yeah. you're you're faced with two two versions of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, um. So, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, we. Um, I was going to ask you a question about who can benefit from your arts. Um, you know, art psychotherapy. Um, so just you know who can I benefit from it you know if you want to recap yeah absolutely um I think um without sounding too generic anyone and everyone can 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 benefit from psychotherapy I mean I work in a very sort of um like I don't work in a diagnostic way you know the western medical model is all around labeling people Mm. um, so that's not my belief system Mm. it's about what happened to you and who helping you to understand you know who you decided to become Mm. so um if anyone is feeling like they are stuck in a particular aspect of life or they are in a sort of depressive they're having a depressive response to life Mm. um low energy low motivation um or if they have um I guess I'm using some of the most common uh, reasons why why people come um, if people are experiencing quite an, an anxious relationship with life, yeah. where they're quite, um, you know, they're worried a lot, um, you know, they need support in managing their stress around them, mm. or if they're considering a life transition, which is difficult, like leaving a relationship, starting a relationship, changing mm. your career, you know, mm. there's a whole host. Um, and then on top of that, um, I, I am trauma informed. So, you know, mm. a lot of clients come to me um, because they want support with um, some some really um, deep experiences that mm. they've had abuse and so on. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I, f- I feel like I want to get into this. Um, I want to, I want a session. <laughs> I, wanna, <laughs> I feel like I want a session because it just feels like it really, it's really calling to me right now <laughs> after you explain what it is really. Cause I've never, I didn't, when I got onto phone to you and, um, and I said, I've never heard about this. What's going on? And you're like, you never, <laughs> I was like, you know, I haven't. Um, so yeah, but probably we'll just be in touch with you. It's like, I want a session. <laughs> <laughs> um so um you know to I've got like a rapid fire questions uh before we we uh wrap it up but what's next for you before we get into the rapid fire questions what's next for me yeah um I mean I am at the end of my towards the end of my training so Mm -hmm. my focus is just completing my master's it's a four year program (laughs) (laughs) so I'm just about to enter my fourth year um what's exciting me at the moment is that um I'm in this sort of space of um alongside the psychotherapy work um Mm -hmm. I run creative well-being spaces so it's really you know for the public for organizations um really helping people to take care of their mental health and, and well-being without going into some of the deeper trauma and sort of childhood work mm-hmm. um and you know as as part of that as well um I am uh, designing workshops for particular um marginalized communities mm-hmm. um so my heart is really with working with um black indigenous people of color working mm-hmm. with refugees lgbtq Amazing. and sort of um supporting these communities and their stories to be heard through the arts oh, so amazing. a couple of exciting projects coming oh up. that's amazing oh my god that's amazing um let's get into the rapid fire questions um okay you ready <laughs> what is your definition of god universe life my definition of you uni- of the universe, universe. What is your definition of God or universe? Yeah, I mean, I have a spiritual um, 
belief system. So um, I believe in a higher power mm -hmm. um, and that I am, I am loved, mm -hmm. I am supported and I am protected always. Beautiful. What do you think happens when you die? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when I went on my ayahuasca journey, I oh, thought... Oh, you were <laughs> <laughs> I died and came back. <laughs> I died and came back. Yeah, I, mean, I do believe that our, our souls live on. Mm. Um, our souls continue and they come back in um, on different planes, in different mm. forms. Mm. Um, and the the lessons of each lifetime is what we bring forward with us oh beautiful um how do you define religion <laughs> and spirituality <laughs> oh my god these are like ex existential philosophical <laughs> non you have your spiritual awakening on this episode <laughs> i'm telling you goodness um so defining religion and spirituality I believe that religion, um, there's two aspects, two sides to every religion. Mm -hmm. There's the civil side mm -hmm. and then there is the philosophical side. Mm -hmm. And so the philosophical side is what every religion has in common around um, love, peace, oneness, unity. And that's the heart of spirituality. Mm. And with religion, um, every faith has their own uh, rule book on how you should live um mm. and for me like that's the difference that spirituality mm. doesn't have a rule book it's actually what's in your heart mm -hmm. you know you are your own guide mm -hmm. um in terms of right and wrong in this world beautiful beautiful what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn <laughs> <sighs> really getting you think there <laughs> so yeah my longest lesson yeah the longest lesson is around um having my own sense of um of boundaries and saying no yeah I am the eternal um empath and people pleaser and well working on it working yeah. on all of it but yeah just around um actually the ability to to say no um because empathy and compassion without boundaries is essentially dangerous mm -hmm. oh, yes. oh. oh my god yes i could totally resonate with that um okay so um do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures people with horrible beginnings yeah like people who've gone through adversity at the young age end up creating the best futures not necessarily mm -hmm. because it depends on whether or not that person has had the support to actually reflect reflect on you know what happened to them in life mm. um and to you know really make that conscious decision to do different or do better mm. and actually have that you know, self-belief that I am the creator of my own existence. Yeah. So not everyone has that opportunity, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's so important to surrounding yourself with people. Yeah, be your environment just dictates everything, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, where was I? <laughs> okay. I'm fully in present moment when? Uh, I'm fully in the present moment when I'm, in nature beautiful do you believe that there is an end to healing <laughs> uh an end to healing oh my goodness absolutely not <laughs> because you can have done all the work on yourself but there will always be a situation or something that is triggering and your reaction to it may have gone down. It's less amplified than yeah. when you started doing the work 10 years ago. But, um, you know, I feel like our our souls are constantly in a process of evolution. Yeah. And that's actually a gift that we're giving ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. You said it perfectly. Beautiful. Um, the world needs more of what? 
the world needs more empathy. Beautiful. Uh, one last question. If there is someone who's going through their spiritual awakening or going through dark and at this dark night of the soul, um, adversity right now, what would you tell them? To, to listen to themselves, mm -hmm. to create a space, to have a radical, radically honest mm -hmm. conversation with themselves and to trust what they're hearing. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, how can people contact you? Um, I have a website. Um, shall I just yes, say share it? it, share it. Yeah. Yeah, share um, it. So my website is uh, zyramugal.com. Um, Z-A-I-R-A-M-U-G-H-A-L. And you can also find me on Instagram and TikTok. Um, and my handle is at Art Healing with Zyra. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Zyra, for coming on this podcast. And like, I'm sure many of our listeners who will tap into arts and, you know, and do that work, that important work through arts. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for the invitation to share more about me and about this work that I'm doing. And yeah. yeah. I really appreciate this time with you. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madhya Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosen. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.